Hey everybody, welcome back to my workshop and another simple woodworking project. This time I'm making a garden bench using some cheap 2x4 studs, a couple of 1x4 boards, and real simple construction techniques. You should be able to make this in a weekend. The studs that I picked up for this project weren't that great. I mean, it's really hard to get really decent 2x4 studs at the home center, but these were, it was a particularly hard time this time. It was like the bottom of the rack. I bought an extra one just to make sure that I could cut out the good parts of each one. All of the legs are gonna be angled at a 10 degree angle. So I can just tip my miter gauge over and lock it in. I'll set up that stop block on my miter gauge so that I can get equal lengths to all four legs. It would also be really easy to cut these out using a miter saw. I just thought I would use my table saw because I'm gonna need it to rip these boards down to their width also. And that's another thing, I standardized all the widths on these boards to, so that they're all three inches wide. And so all of these two by fours are gonna need to be cut down to that size, if nothing else, to get rid of those rounded edges on them. I'm gonna cut four one by fours that are gonna hold the two leg assemblies together. These will also be cut at a 10 degree angle, only this time I need to flip the board for each cut so that those angles are angled in towards each other. The actual length of these isn't that important, just as long as they're consistent. I wanted to rip all of these boards after I had cut them to their lengths because the parts that I wanna cut off of them differ from board to board. It's a matter of examining each board to find which edge is the worst edge that I could cut off. So I'll kind of be biased towards that side. So first I'll just trim off a thin strip on each of these boards just to square up those rounded edges. Now that I've got that one edge cut on each board, I can move my rip fence over three inches away from the blade and cut these all down to their final size. I designed this bench about a year ago and I made a quick prototype out in my driveway using just handheld power tools. I built that one for my wife's discovery garden. At least that's what I call it. It's this small, ever-changing area in the lower part of our backyard that she uses for experimenting with different garden designs, plants, and materials. You can just kind of walk through it and discover new things all the time. This raised bed is Cobra and Bubbles Cat Garden with catnip, cat mint, lemongrass, and other cat-friendly plants. Bubbles. So the idea last year was to make a cozy bench to fit under this jasmine growing on this wire arch. You might remember those planter boxes I made during the lockdown a couple of years ago. The bench is intended to add a bright splash of color. It's a quiet, intimate space for a small, intimate bench where you can 
Just take a few minutes to sit and just be. So I call it the meditation bench. Anyways, back in my shop for some woodworking meditation. And really, isn't woodworking a form of meditation in a way? I mean, you, you have to be focused and just be in the present in order to build something. You just don't want to get sleepy, or at least don't get sleepy when you're working on power tools. I'm pulling out my router table so that I can cut a chamfer around the end of each of those legs. This is just a small bevel that's going to help prevent the ends of those boards from potentially splitting or splintering if you move the bench around. One thing you might notice about these chamfers is that it's not going to be a consistent bevel all the way around because the ends of those boards were mitered. You know, uh, it's one of those things where I guess you could figure out a way to correct that discrepancy, but it just really doesn't matter to me. Nobody's going to really be looking at the bottom of those legs. I'm gonna use my pocket hole jig to pre-drill some pocket holes into the skirt pieces. These are the pieces that are gonna hold the top slats in place. I wanna drill these holes now before I put together the leg assemblies. And this is really how this bench is gonna differ from that first bench I made. This one's not gonna be painted, so I need to conceal the fasteners better. In that first version, I just put screws directly into everything. So all of these pocket holes are going to be inside and underneath the seat of the bench. So you won't see them. I really need to get a new piece of that hardboard to replace the top of my workbench. I've got a lot of dried paint and stuff on there that I need to scrape off so that I can get a flat surface for putting these things together. What I've done here is I've clamped a board to my workbench to act as a straight edge so that I can align the tops of each of these legs. I'll start by attaching that inside connector. That's the one with the pocket holes. I'll attach it with glue and a couple of screws. Again, these screws are gonna be on the underside and the inside so you won't see them. It's always a good idea to drill holes first before driving screws into place. Even though these are self-tapping screws, you technically don't need to, but when they're this close to the edge of a board, they can cause that board to split. Then I can flip the boards over and glue that outside piece into place. 
I'm not going to put screws on this one. I'm just going to clamp it down and make sure that it's flush on all sides. One thing I like to do when I'm gluing up pieces like this, where it's really important that they don't slide out of position, is to apply the glue and then just get everything lined up and then just let it sit for about 10 or 15 minutes. Then I can clamp it down and it won't slide out of place. For years, I've had people tell me to put salt on those glue joints and that'll prevent it from sliding. But honestly, I've tried that a number of times and it just never really does anything. So this method seems to work pretty well. Now I can cut out the front and rear stretchers that'll join those two leg assemblies together. These boards don't require mitered ends, but they're gonna need a bevel on each of the long edges. Again, this is gonna be a 10 degree bevel, so I'll just tilt my blade over 10 degrees using the legs themselves as a guide. After cutting the bevel on one edge of the board, I needed to attach this board to my rip fence to prevent that little pointy edge from sliding under the rip fence. I guess you'd call that kind of a zero clearance rip fence because my regular rip fence has a gap there. And just like on the end pieces, I need to pre-drill those pocket holes along these front and back stretchers. The one thing I found really confusing here and I really had to stop and think about was making sure that I drilled those on the right face of each of those boards. Because of the way that they're beveled, it makes a difference. It would have been really easy for me to have those going the wrong direction or have them on the outside face of the board, which would show. Before I attach those stretchers, I wanna make sure that I give the legs a quick sanding to make sure that all the surfaces are flush. So I think what I could do is just glue and clamp this together. Even though it's at, at 10 degree bevels on these sides, I was afraid my clamps would slip off, but it doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to bother it any. I wonder if I should bo do both stretchers at the same time. That'd be a pretty bold move, huh? <laughs> All right, we're gonna do it. The main thing I'm trying to do here is avoid using any fasteners, at least ones that I have to cover up. So I, what, one thing I could do, and kind of my original thought on this was to attach these stretchers just with glue and a couple of screws in there, but I would have to countersink those screws and maybe you know use a forstner bit to make a wider hole at the opening of it so I could pound a, a dowel in there and cover it up. That would be one way of doing it. Or just use a dowel. I could do that. In fact, I might do that. I might just go ahead and put dowels in these after I've got this assembled, but for now, all I want to do is glue this together somehow. 
So the thing about these clamps is that they've got these pivoting heads on it. So that kind of works in my favor. And with this, as long as, oops. And it, since it's just a 10 degree bevel, it seems to want to hold it all right. I think if it was like a 45 degree angle, that, that wouldn't be possible. This would, it would just slide off of there. So let's see if this works. And, uh, oh, that's kind of slipping, isn't it? I think I was wrong about these. They are gonna, the clamps aren't slipping as much as the boards are moving. Oh crap. Look at that. <laughs> it just slides up out of there. Okay, that's not very good. You know what? Hmm. Okay, plan B. I gotta go back to putting screws in this. I think that's the only way I can really get this to work. Keep in mind, if you're gonna paint this, you don't even need to bother with drilling these holes. All right, so now I can just drop a screw in there. The trick is just to make sure that it stays flush. Okay, that worked. Meanwhile, my glue is setting up. <clears throat> okay. Piece of cake. I'm gonna get this one in. Oh, shoot. Damn it. I got the pocket holes going on the wrong side. Ugh. Okay. Look what I did here. See that, those pocket holes, those are supposed to be on the inside. Hope this glue hasn't dried up. Find out. Oh man, that's tight. Okay, let's try again. I think I'll put a little more glue on there though. Yeah. That'll do it. Look at this, look at this, look at, look at this. That's basically a bench. Basically. A little bit of a warp. Eh, eh, eh. That's because these top boards have a little bit of a twist in them. But that's okay. That's pretty normal. I mean, when you're using two by fours, it's pretty normal. So, but once I get those top pieces on there, it'll all, it'll all flatten out. Here I'm cutting out some dowel pins to fill in those holes. And they just get glued into place. Now back to my two by fours, I can cut out slats for this seat. These are all gonna be three inches wide by about 38 inches long. What I'm doing here is cutting all of these oversized so that I can cut them to their final widths on my miter saw, which is actually gonna be a little bit easier than my table saw. My stop block on that miter gauge can't extend out that far. And the question you might be asking is, why don't I just cut these oversized pieces also on my miter saw? And that would be a very good question, to which I don't really have an answer. 
I think when I was cutting these out, I hadn't really thought about how I was going to set up a stop block yet. Well, I certainly wouldn't be able to rip these on my miter saw, so there's that. By the way, all of my mobile tool stands, such as this miter stand, are part of my weekend workshop course. Basically, everything that you see in this shot is something that I built for that course. It has full sets of plans and de really detailed videos on how you can make all of this stuff. If you're interested, head over to theweekendworkshop.com. The whole idea of the course is to show you how you can set up a complete woodworking shop in a small space, such as a garage, even if you have to share that space with a, a car. With that stop block clamped in place, I can cut out all five of these seat slats to the exact same length. One thing I wanna do is on the front and rear slats is I wanna just kind of dog ear those corners. I'm just cutting those off at a 45 degree angle. I just think it makes the bench look a little bit nicer. Oh yeah, those dowel pins are dry now, so I can cut those off using my flush trim saw. Well, this is a good example of what happens when you don't double check your measurements. <laughs> these aren't supposed to be the same length as these, but I looked on my plans and I just quickly glanced at the length and I was glancing, looking at the length of these stretchers. These need to be like a good four inches longer, which is why, why I originally had cut those close to the 38 inches that I wanted. And then when I took it over to my miter saw, I thought, wow, did I overestimate that much? Cause I cut off those pretty big chunks and well, that's why. So this isn't gonna work. That looks pretty dumb that way. And so I need to go get some new two by fours, unfortunately, cause I don't have any right now. Oh well. I should have mentioned this earlier, but if you're gonna be using two by four studs from the home center to build a woodworking project, make sure you get dry studs. These are the ones that are labeled KDHT, kiln dried and heat treated. Okay, I think that's a little bit better. <laughs> Something like that. Boom, there's a bench. Okay, so I think what I wanna do is make a chamfer around each one of these. I'm gonna attach all those slats using screws in those pocket holes that I drilled earlier. The only challenge here is just getting them all lined up so that they're even and spacing them apart evenly. I want a small gap between each one.
there's three screws that'll hold the front and the back slats in place and then there's one screw on each end of those three middle slats. It wouldn't be a bad idea to glue these in place also. One thing I like to do with pocket screws is to tighten them down by hand. That way I have a little bit more control over how much torque is going into those. So attaching those top slats took most of that twist out. There's still a little bit, but it's not enough to really worry about. This is gonna be setting on the ground anyways and it'll settle, it'll find its own level. And I'll give the entire bench a thorough sanding to smooth it all out. Without doubt, the most protective coating you can give to any outdoor project is paint. A good exterior house paint will last for years. You can use clear outdoor stains or sealers, but you'll have to reapply those every year or two and eventually the wood is just going to gray out anyway. For this project, I really wanted to showcase the wood and its grain, so I decided to go with a stain and sealer. This is a deck stain and sealer that I bought for a fence that we have in the backyard. Well, that's a lot different than I was expecting. It's real thick. I don't know if that's the pigment in there or what, but this is water-based, so hopefully it's a little bit easier to put on and clean up. I probably should have had them shake this at the hardware store. This is somewhere in between a paint and a stain. It's transparent, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes on. You've probably seen this tip before, but if you punch a few holes around that rim of the can, it allows the paint or stain to drain back into the can rather than pool up in that groove. I found that using a foam brush was a good way to get that stain in between those slats. And of course, it wouldn't be a bad idea to stain or paint this before assembling it, but I'm not too worried about this. I'm not building this to last for a hundred years. This isn't an heirloom project. If I you know, get a few good years out of it. I'm happy. I didn't spend a lot of time or money building this thing, so it's no big deal. But hopefully this stain and sealer will provide some protection against the elements. I think that probably the harshest element on outdoor furniture is the sun.